الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا فعلمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let me start off by asking a question. Why is 40 the pinnacle of wisdom? Why is it that at the age of 40, we reach the pinnacle of our wisdom? Who can tell me? Go ahead. Mid-age, but I mean, you'll see 40-year-old individuals that are 40 years old, but they behave like kids, right? So why 40, though? What's specific with this number? Bismillah. Allah chose for Allahu Akbar. So it is the age that, the, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the prophets and messengers to receive revelation. But now, is it because they're receiving revelation, or is it the age of 40, though? Right? Which one's coming first? And I'm arguing that 40 comes first. So what's specific about 40? Like what's meant to happen at the age of 40 that all of a sudden you've hit the pinnacle of wisdom? Go ahead. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got the first verses of the Quran. MashaAllah. You know, that's really good piggybacking off of what he said. Jazakallah khair. How about from the sisters? Why is 40 the pinnacle of, of wisdom? Experience, exactly. But what type of experiences? What should what is expected that you've experienced by the age of forty? Maturity? What does that look like though? Family. Family? What what does that mean? You would have experienced what by family? Growing a family. Growing a family? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that went in a different direction, but I'll have to address that later. Go ahead. Marriage, parenthood, dealing with income. You guys are all very ha positive people, mashallah. I mean, if someone to tell me, by 40 you should experience death. Go ahead. Experience all the phases of life. Experience all the phases of life, except for old age. Yeah, that's pretty true. But the expectation is, you wouldn't have experienced someone close to you that has died. You wouldn't have experienced some sort of financial loss. You wouldn't have experienced some sort of major sickness. You would have experienced some sort of heartbreak in your life. You would have experienced some sort of failure in your life. All of these things would have happened so that you can reach maturity as was mentioned. Right? So that is why 40 is considered the pinnacle of wisdom. And it was also the age that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the prophecy of messengers to receive revelation. Now on a side tangent, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us, that the average age of his ummah will be between 60 to 70 years old. So once you've hit 40, you've actually hit, you know, over the, the halfway mark of your life. That there's not too much longer left. But all the major things that you've meant to experience, you should have experienced by now. So now with that being said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes the dunya in the Quran, he tells us, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورُ that what is the life of this world except an enjoyable, deceitful life, right? So the hayat dunya this is in contrast to al hayat al So the hayat dunya is the lowly life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this life as a very lowly life. It is not the life that you are striving for, it is the life that you're experiencing, but it is a lowly life that you have something forward to look after too. And then number two, in describing this lonely life, he says that there will be moments that you will enjoy yourself, right? There's a mata'a, there's an enjoyment that you will experience, but it is mata'a al It is an enjoyment that is ever deceptive and ever deceiving. So when you experience this enjoyment, you think, subhanAllah, this is the epitome of life. I've experienced it now, this is it. This is what I was created to do. But in reality, it is very deceiving and very deceptive. It is very delusional, it makes people delusional about the life of this world. Thinking that you were created to live for this life alone. But the reality isn't, is that you were created for the life of the hereafter. That is what you were actually created for. So what I wanted to share in this lecture, are what are principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us in the Quran that will help us deal with 
the hardships and calamities that we face? And how do we actually survive and thrive in this experience? So the first thing I want to address is our own mental health. And the way we want to do this is if you look at the world around you, you see calamity, catastrophe, and death everywhere, subhanAllah. You think of Palestine, you think of Gaza, you think of Rafa, subhanAllah, like every day, just catastrophe after catastrophe. You think about Sudan, you think about Libya, you think about Afghanistan, you think about Pakistan, you think about Syria, you think about Iraq. The vast majority of our lands that we come from are going through some sort of conflict. And it pains you, subhanAllah, that time after time, this is what we keep seeing. So how do you cope with this? Well, let us look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in Surah Al-Imran, وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ That these are the days that we allow to fluctuate between the people. Meaning that there are certain days you're going to do well, and there are certain days that you're going to struggle. There are certain days that you will be happy and there are certain days that you will be miserable. There are certain days that you will be rich, there are certain days that you will be poor. There are certain days that you will be healthy and there are certain days that you will be sick. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us about this? So that we do not get fixed on the state that we are in. So if you're in a state of weakness, you're in a state of poverty, you're in a state of sickness, understand that that state will not last forever. And if you're in a state of prosperity, you're in a state of health, you're in a state of wealth, understand that that too will not stay forever. Your state will constantly be changing. Be changing. Right? Imam Shafi, in one of his poems, he says, وَلَا حُزْنٌ يَدُومُ وَلَا سُرُورُ وَلَا بُحْسٌ عَلَيْكَ وَلَا رَخَاءُ He says that there's no harm that remains forever, nor is there any uh, happiness that remains forever, in, in summary. So what is that meant to teach us? So if your current state is not a positive one, understand that soon, inshallah, the state will be over and we will become a positive one. So be optimistic. Look forward and think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا That after the hardship will come ease for sure. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى Right? That which is to come is better than that which exists right now. So if things are tough, be, posi uh, be positive, be optimistic, that inshallah things are going to work out. You have to have that frame of mind that this is all temporary and this soon will be over. But how about if things are positive in your life right now and what we deem positive from a worldly perspective. You're healthy, you're doing well at work, you, um, you know, things are, are good with your family, things are good in your social life, things are looking good. What should our frame of mind be at that time? So if you're down, be positive and optimistic. But if, you are, if things are positive from a worldly life, what should our frame of mind be? Don't say negative. It won't last. Sorry? It won't last. It won't last. Okay, so what should we do then? Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. Allahu Akbar. So that's the first thing we want to do. That in times of prosperity, you have to force yourself to be thankful. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنِ عِبَادِ يَشْكُرُ That very few of my slaves are actually thankful. And this is why when Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he talks about the different tests that the, the slaves are given, he says that the test of patience is easier than the test of gratitude. The test of patience forces you to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The test of gratitude, you have to force yourself to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing you should do is to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those blessings. Now what does that actually do? وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ That if you were to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will prolong your happiness. He will prolong that positive state that you are in. And I'm going to comment on that very shortly, inshallah, as to what that looks like. What else should we be doing if things are going well in your life? Uh, do more help. Best to be charitable and help others. Help you. Okay, so be charitable and, and help people. We're going to include that as a part of our shukr. So shukr is not only to say alhamdulillah, but shukr is to use the blessings that Allah has given you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll accept that as the same, but that's a very good answer. There was a brother in front of him that had his hand up. Who was the other brother? You or him? Go ahead. So remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of ease so that he remembers you in times of hardship. 
right? So this is the advice that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Ta'arraf ila Allah fi raha ya arifka fi shidda. That turn to Allah subhanahu wa taala in times of ease, in times of comfort, and Allah subhanahu wa taala will take care of you and your affairs in times of hardship. But again, we're going to include that as a part of shukr to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Ahsant. So now make sure not to become proud, not to become arrogant, right? One of the things that happens to people is that when they experience prosperity, they start to look down upon people. They start to look upon, uh, they start to think too highly of themselves. They start to think that they're self-sufficient and they no longer rely upon Allah, they no longer depend upon Allah, they're no longer grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So gratitude and humility have to go hand in hand. Gratitude and humility have to go hand in hand. So when things are going positive, make sure you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also live in a state of humility. Live in a state of humility. Now the point that I wanted to get back to is this positive life that we're referring to. Is it a physical state or is it a spiritual state? Meaning that if we have all of the things that we need, is that what causes us happiness? Or do we develop happiness from inside and we become content with all of the things that we have? Which one happens? Spiritual. The spiritual. So you have to be content from the inside. Sisters, do you agree or disagree? Is happiness internal or external? Internal? Excellent. And that's what we want to look at. Imam al-Shafi, he says, إِذَا كُنْتَ ذَا قَلْبٍ قَنُوعٍ فَأَنْتَ وَمَالِكُ الدُّنْيَا سَوَاءُ That if you are able to make your heart content with everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, then you and the one that possesses everything are equal. Right? Shaitan makes us think that the more we accumulate, the more we have, the happier we will become. But that is not true. You need to learn to develop to be content with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to learn to develop gratitude and satisfaction with your circumstances. Now how do you actually do that? That is a difficult question, right? And just to go on a quick side tangent, the reality is the opposite is a very, very painful reality. That if you keep accumulating, thinking that I will eventually become happy by accumulating more, sooner or later you will realize that this is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because your heart is empty, you're not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that you should, perhaps you're following more into haram, and things are going to be absolutely difficult. So do not prioritize the physical life, prioritize the spiritual life. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu says that whoever prioritizes their akhirah and gives preference to their akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rectify their dunya and their akhirah. But whoever prioritizes the life of this world, they will lose the life of this world and the next. They will lose the life of this world and the next. So you have to understand that your attachment to the life of this world only brings about further misery. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ is told in Surah Tawbah. فَلَا تُعْجِبَكَ أَمْوَالُهُمْ وَأَوْلَادُهُمْ إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُعَذِّبُهُمْ بِهَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَتَزْحَقَ أَنفُسَهُمْ وَهُمْ كَافِرُونَ That do not be impressed by their wealth nor by their children. For surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only uses those things to punish them and then to destroy them as they are from the disbelievers. As they are from the disbelievers. So now an important principle to establish over here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give the dunya to those whom he loves solely. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the dunya to everyone and only gives the deen to those whom he loves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the dunya to everyone and only gives the deen to those whom he loves. And we aren't taught this enough. We aren't reminded of this enough. People think that, oh, if I have more wealth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me more. If I have a bigger house, a better job, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me more. But that's not true. A sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for you is that He engages you in His worship. 
A sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for you is that He gives you the understanding of this deen. A sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for you is that He engages you in the teaching of the Qur'an and in the learning of the Qur'an. These are signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Right? In our cultures, you know, I, I shouldn't bash our cultures because there's a lot of good in them as well. But one of the negative things that comes out of our cultures is that when someone becomes a doctor or gets this, uh, you know, a lofty job or something like that, they're like, mashallah, tabarakallah, look at, you know, he's become a, a doctor. Which, and doctors, mashallah, they have a, amazing jobs. I'm not putting that down. But I'm saying that it's as if he's reached this lofty status, Allahu Akbar, that he's become a doctor. But if their child decides to become an imam, or the child decides to like go study the deen, all of a sudden it's like, oh, poor child, couldn't get into anything else, so he went to go study the deen. Right? Like our priorities are completely reversed, and that should not be the case. In fact, our biggest honor and our biggest privilege is that our children are committed to the deen and studying the deen and learning the deen. So now getting back to the first principle, the first principle is that your days are going to fluctuate. Some days are going to be good, some days are going to be difficult. Learn to react to both of them. In difficult days, be positive and optimistic that things will work out. So do not get bogged down in the trenches. And when things are going well, whatever that means, at that time be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and live a life of humility. Number two, what does success actually look like? What does success actually look like? Who can give me a definition of success? Brothers or sisters, bismillah. Ahsant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in Surah Al-Imran that whoever is saved from the hellfire and entered into paradise, then they are the successful ones. They are the successful ones. Even when uh, we were reciting, uh, we were praying Salatul Maghrib in the first zakah, we recited from Suratul Al Buruj. In Surah Al Buruj, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us, us is success? He says, kabir. That is the great achievement. The individual that has Iman and does righteous deeds and is entered into paradise. That is the ultimate success that you will attain. So going back to the life of this world, and I think things are getting you know, more chaotic as time goes on. You know, there was a time where people measured your success by your wealth, by your position in, in life and your authority. Now it's like, how many followers do you have on TikTok? It's like, yo, I got 10 million followers on TikTok. And that's some sort of like status symbol now, right? Or you have like a million followers on Instagram, a status symbol. But what does that mean? And I think this is where, subhanAllah, if people knew the level of accountability that comes with people following you, no one would want to lead. If people knew the level of accountability that comes with people following you, no one would want to lead. Because you're responsible for your flock. So the more people that you have following, the more people you're responsible for. If you're not guiding them towards good, that means you failed in your position. You could have one million followers, you could have a billion followers, but if you're not guiding them towards good, you failed. Whereas the individual that has one follower and they guide them towards good is successful. And this is why I want you to think about this deeply. There are certain prophets that will show up on the day of judgment and they will have no followers. There are certain prophets that will come and they will have a handful of followers. The greatest example we see of that in the Quran is Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam, he gave da'wah for over 950 years, meaning he lived an extremely long life, subhanAllah, compared to us. But on the day of judgment, he's only going to show up with a handful of followers. Will any of us have the audacity to say that Nuh alayhi salam was a failure? Hasha lillah, billah. Never. Nuh alayhi salam is from the Ulul Azam, from the greatest of prophets. From the greatest of prophets. Not just regular prophets, but from the elite of the elite of the prophets. So how could anyone say that he didn't have a following, thus he must be a failure? So what do we learn from this? Is that success is not in the results, Success is in the effort. Nuh is a success story, 
not because he only had a handful of followers. He is a success story because he consistently and persistently worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without giving up. That is what true success is. And when an individual does that, that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters them into Jannah. And this is like a, an aqidah point that's very important to understand. Do we actually enter Jannah through our deeds? Or do we enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's very important to keep reminding us uh, ourselves of this. But we enter Jannah through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day the Prophet sallallahu was sitting with his companions and he tells them that none of you will enter Jannah through your deeds. They said, not even you, Ya Rasulullah. He said, not even I. Illa Except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to enshroud me with his mercy. Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he comments on this hadith by bringing another hadith from the Mustadrak uh, of Al-Hakim where he says that there was a man that lived from the people before us. He lived for 500 years on an island by himself. And all he did was worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Day and night he's just worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Till he's had enough of this life. So he asks Allah, Oh Allah, I'm ready to die. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes him to die. Allah Akbar. Look at how righteous this man is. That he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers immediately. So now we move forward to the day of judgment. And the day of judgment has come and this man is now going to have his reckoning. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, enter this man into Jannah through my mercy. And this man says, no, no Allah, no, 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 not by your mercy, but through my deeds. I sacrificed, I gave up and all I did was worship you for 500 years. I want you to enter me into Jannah through my deeds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands for this man's deeds to be brought forth. And you see mountains upon mountains upon mountains of deeds that are there. And then this man, he gets happy. He's like, Allahu Akbar, I made it. I'm set, I'm good to go. I can't wait to get to offer those. Those are my words, not in the hadith. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands the angels, bring one blessing. Bring one blessing and place it on the other side of the scale. And as soon as that one blessing is placed, those mountains upon mountains upon mountains are weightless in relation to this blessing. Who knows what that blessing was? His eyesight. His eyesight. It was his eyesight. So this man's eyesight is placed on one side of the scale and 500 years of constant worship is placed on the other and it's as if he has no weight. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees, enter this man into the hellfire. And this man now panics. He's like, la ilaha illallah, what did I do? I should have gone for the mercy of Allah. And he says, oh Allah, I beg you with you and I plead with you, enter me into Jannah through your mercy. Allah asked him, are you sure? And he says, yes, oh Allah, enter me into Jannah through your mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters him into Jannah through his mercy. So now when we say that ultimate success is to be entered into Jannah, that is a factual statement. But where the misunderstanding happens is that your entrance into Jannah is not contingent on the deeds that you do, it is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what shouldn't be forgotten is that in order to be eligible for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to meet certain criteria, which is the shahada of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah wa ilzam al nafs bi arkan al khams and the commitment to the five pillars of Islam. You have tawheed, you have your commitment to the five pillars of Islam, you're eligible for the mercy of Allah. You don't have those two, you're not eligible for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now begs the question if our entrance into Jannah is contingent upon the mercy of Allah. What is the point of doing deeds? Why do we do good deeds? Who can tell us? Why do we do good deeds? Go ahead. The deeds make you eligible and they determine your level. Ahsant. So the deeds make you eligible. So there's a minimal requirement of deeds that needs to be met. And then number two, they determine your level in the hereafter. That is the benefit of doing more deeds. And you may not realize this right now, but 
we need to force ourselves to understand this concept as best as we possibly can. No one wants to crawl into Jannah. No one wants to crawl into Jannah. In just one hadith, the Prophet wasallam, he tells us about high rises in Jannah. And he's sitting out with his companions one day in the desert. There's no light pollution like we have. And you can just see the stars, you can see the constellations everywhere. And he tells his companions that in Jannah, there will be high rises that will twinkle and they'll be as far as the eye can see. And subhanAllah, the companions, they got sad. They said, Ya Rasulullah, that must only be for the prophets and messengers. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, no, it is for those who believed in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and did righteous deeds. Meaning that you're going to have different levels of residences in Jannah. You have some people that are going to be living in pearl tents. You have other people that are going to be living in high rises. You have other people that are going to be living in mansions and palaces and castles made out of gold and silver. And this is Allahu Akbar. You know, I want you to think about the richest people that we know in this dunya. Your Elon Musk's, your Jeff Bezos, your Bill Gates, all of these people. Do any of these people have a house built out of gold? Do any of these people have a house made out of silver? Do any of these people have a house made out of pearls? They don't. As rich as they are, they don't have that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the epitome of luxury only to be in Jannah. Only to be attainable in Jannah. Right? When the description of the house of Amr ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is given, it's this massive passion, this massive palace and mansion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for him. That has bricks of gold and silver. And that is what one looks forward to. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us that those that memorize the Qur'an and recite the Qur'an, they will be entered into Jannah. And they will be told, Iqra wa rattil kama kunta turattilu fi dunya. Read and recite just like you read, used to read and recite in the dunya. Now what is the beautiful thing about that? Like imagine, you know, Jannah has 100 levels. Each level is a distance as far as the eye can see. And they're going to continue to recite the Qur'an as angels ascend them to as far as they can go through their recitation of the Qur'an. So the more you recite the Qur'an in this dunya, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates your status in the hereafter. And that only happens through the good deeds that you do. And you may think, subhanAllah, in this life, we easily settle for mediocrity. You know, as long as I have a, a roof over my, my head, I have food to eat, you know, I have something to drink, I have a bed to sleep on, alhamdulillah. And we should be grateful for whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us. But this does not apply to the life of the hereafter. For the life of the hereafter, you want to covet. You want to be as greedy as possible that you don't want to be in the lowest levels of Jannah. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, he tells us that if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah, ask Him for Al-Firdaus. Don't just settle for entrance into Jannah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the highest level. That is what you should be striving for. So the deeds that we do are for those higher ranks in Jannah. Now getting back to our principle is what does success look like? Success, my dear brothers and sisters, is to be entered into Jannah, is not in material possessions. If you want to talk about success from a worldly perspective, it is to be content with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. If you're able to be content with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, then this is success in this life and success in the hereafter is to be entered into Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from its inhabitants. Allahumma ameen. Principle number three. When you look at the story of Musa alayhi salam, particularly in Surah Taha, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells them, اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فَرْعَوْنَا إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ That go to Fir'aun, he has surely transgressed all bounds. 
And we know the famous dua that comes right after that. He says, وَقَالَ رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي He starts off by making dua that, Oh Allah, help me carry this burden that you've given me by expanding my chest. Make easy for me my affairs. Loosen the knots on my tongue so that the people can understand what I'm saying. The disservice we do to ourselves is that we always stop at this point. The dua of Musa alayhi salam does not stop over here. Musa alayhi salam, he continues. He goes on to say, وَجَعَلِّي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي هَارُونَ أَخِي أُشْتُدْ بِهِ أَزْرِي وَأَشْرِكْهُ فِي أَمْرِي كَيْ نُسَبِّحُكَ كَثِيرًا وَنَذْكُرُكَ كَثِيرًا Right? He goes on to say that, O oh Allah, grant me a companion. Grant me a companion who will strengthen my resolve in this mission. And that we can remember you together and that we can glorify you together. This is an important point that as human beings we were not created to be in isolation we were not created to be by ourselves we were created to be surrounded by people right in fact when you look at the word insan people often assume that the word insan comes from the siyan which is forgetfulness which even though it is a, a common theory is not linguistically true linguistically the word insan comes from one that socializes, one that needs to interact with others. And subhanAllah, I want you to think about this. You know, it was recently, within the last four or five years, that like a light bulb went off in my head when I heard about this. But where was Adam alayhi salam? Where was Adam alayhi salam? In Jannah. What did he have in Jannah? Before that, what did he have in Jannah? Everything. Adam alayhi salam, had everything in Jannah. Everything. Yet that was still not enough. Because he felt lonely. He said, oh Allah, I need someone to share this joy with. It's no fun having everything if you're by yourself. You need someone to share that joy with. So he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a spouse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Hawa. And for me, this was like the, uh, like the switch that went off. Like it truly showed me that as human beings... We weren't created to be by ourselves. We were created to have spouses. We were created to be surrounded by friends. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in. That is our, our fitrah. Is to be surrounded by people. Because Adam alayhi salam, he's had everything. Yet if he had no one to share it with, it was still emptiness that he felt. So he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a companion. Now, because we have this desire to be surrounded by people, we are very vulnerable to the choices that we make as to who we choose to be our companions and our friends and our spouses. And this is why the Prophet wasallam he tells us, and this applies both ways, even though uh, the hadith is, is mentioned about women, but a woman is married for four reasons. What are the four reasons she's married for? Go ahead. Okay, her family and her lineage. Her, 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 uh, her beauty, her, her wealth, and her power and authority. Right? These are the, the four reasons why a, woman's is, a woman is married. And even though the Prophet ﷺ mentions this, what does he tell us? He tells us that whoever marries for the deen will never be disappointed. Will never be disappointed. Wealth and power goes away. Family lineage is of no avail in the hereafter. The only thing that will help you is the deen. So that is the first criterion you should be looking for in your spouse. Or I should say the first, but I'll say the most important criterion that you should be looking for in your spouse is the deen. Without a shadow of a doubt. This is the person that's meant to help you get to Jannah. Now the same thing applies to your friends. Your closest and most intimate friends the people that you spend the most amount of time with, it shouldn't be dependent on, you know, what soccer team you like, or what basketball team you like, or what hockey team you like, or, you know, what, uh, what type of cryptocurrencies you're invested in. That shouldn't be the basis of your friendship. You can have it as tangential things, or secondary things, that's not a problem. But the primary focus should be that together we want to get to Jannah. Together we want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Right? What does Musa alayhi salam say? So that we may glorify you and remember you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the primary function of our relationship, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us the exact opposite as well. He tells us the exact opposite as well. That people will show up on the Day of Judgment and they're about to be thrown into the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them an opportunity to give their excuses. What do those people say? They go on to say, Ya wayla talaytani lama takhid fulan al khalila. Then woe to me only if I didn't take so and so as a friend. If I didn't do that, I would have been saved. I would have been entered into Jannah. People will realize that on the Day of Judgment that your influence is what dictates your life. Whoever you allow to influence you will dictate your life. Now this leads into not only our friends, not only our spouse, but even the people that you follow on social media. I want you to think about this for a second. People think, you know what? There's no problem on following sports celebrities on social media. Who can tell me some of the negative things that you will be exposed to by following sports celebrities and athletes on social media? What are some of the negative things that come out of that? Go ahead. Haram activities they may promote, creating or Excellent. So a lot of it stems from who's sponsoring them, right? A lot of times it's alcohol companies, tobacco companies, gambling companies. These are the ones that are sponsoring them. So whenever they're promoting an item, a lot of the times it's going to be haram. And I love what the brother did. He just gave this general answer, right, of the haram things. It encompasses everything I want to cover. So I didn't even get to go into the specifics and ask you more for, for your opinions. I apologize. But that's one thing. Number two is what do these athletes do when they celebrate? And this is why, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and, and, and protect him and have mercy upon him. Our brother Hakim al Hafidhahullah, in 94 and 95, and this is going to be, you know, beyond your years for a lot of you. When he won the NBA championship, he outright told his team, any one of you comes close to me with a bottle of champagne, you're going to be in trouble. And they had like their own celebration with Hakim Olajuwon where no alcohol was involved. And then they had their own private haram celebration later with the alcohol. But that was like, you know, the Muslim identity, the Muslim persona was very uh, vivid and, and very present. MashaAllah. So then when they're celebrating, they're celebrating with alcohol. And you may know that alcohol is haram, but subliminally what's happening is you're becoming desensitized to it. Oh, when I celebrate, I should be celebrating with alcohol because that's what, you know, is, what, that's what we're meant to do. And how bad could alcohol be? Right? You become desensitized to the haram nature of it. Number three, the relationships that they're in. Right? The relationships that they're in. How many of them have children out of wedlock? How many, you know, different, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Illicit relationships have they had? And these are the things that are being promoted. And you may think it's okay, I'm following a sports athlete, but at the end of the day, if you're becoming desensitized to it, the haram does not seem as haram as it should. And you may think that I know it's haram, but the, the pain of, of, of seeing the haram isn't there anymore, right? The Prophet Sallallahu he tells us that whoever amongst you sees an evil, let them change it with their hands. And if you're not able to, Speak out against it. And if you're not able to, hate it in your hearts. And that is the weakest of iman. But what's happening to us that when we see all of this haram, we're no longer hating it. We're like, you know, it's a part of the dunya. They're doing it, I'm not doing it, it's okay. No, it's not. You still have to hate it in your heart. You still have to hate it in your heart. So you have to be very careful of the people that you follow on social media and the desensitization that it leads to as a result of you following them. So be very careful as to the friends that you choose. Be very careful as to the spouse that you choose. Be very careful as to the people that you follow on social media. The last one that I'll leave you with is your Iman will fluctuate in this life. It's inevitable. Everyone's Iman fluctuates. How do you protect and preserve your Iman? And remember I was telling you about how that light switch went on? Another light switch that went on early in my, in, my, in my studies, alhamdulillah, 
by the uh, Father of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that if you analyze the Quran how many times is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked or commanded rather to ask for an increment in something that oh Allah give me more of something he's not commanded to ask for more iman he's not commanded to ask for more taqwa he's not commanded to ask for more salah or dhikr or recitation of the Quran but he's commanded with that, oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. And you have multiple statements from our predecessors that nothing will protect you like knowledge. Nothing will keep you company like knowledge. Nothing will keep you connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like knowledge. It was amazing that Ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, he was asked, if you could come back to life and be a mujahid or be a seeker of knowledge, which one would you want to be? Right? We all know the virtues of a dying shaheed. We all know of the virtues. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in this beautiful like ranking almost. That whoever obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then they will be in the company of the prophets, the siddiqun, the martyrs, um, and the righteous, and the righteous, and what a great company they are, and what a great company they are. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid it out for us as to what are the rankings in the hereafter. You have the prophets and messengers, then you have the truthful ones, and the truthful ones, a lot of the Mufassirun, they said they are the scholars, they are the scholars. And then you have the shuhada, they are the martyrs, and then the salihin, they are the righteous. So Ibn Mubarak rahimahullah, was asked, if you could come back to life and dedicate your life to just one thing, what would you dedicate it to? He says, without any hesitance, without a shadow of a doubt, to become a seeker of knowledge. Even though the martyr has so many virtues to it, subhanAllah, that they are in the hearts of green birds, they will have you know, X, Y, and Z, um, you know, mansions in paradise, they will enter into Jannah without hisab, they will have from the Hurul Ayn as they desire, subhanAllah, all of this. Yet he knew, because he was a man of knowledge, that seeking knowledge was better. He knew that seeking knowledge was better. The Prophet sallallahu he tells us that even the fish in the sea seek forgiveness for the seeker of knowledge. Even the fish in the sea seek forgiveness for the seeker of knowledge. He tells us that the virtue of the scholar over the worshipper is like the virtue of the moon over the rest of the stars when it is a full moon and night. So I want you to think how bright the full moon is when it's a full moon and compare it to the rest of the stars. Which one's brighter? Without a shadow of a doubt, it is the moon. And he says that is the virtue of the scholar over the worshipper. Meaning you have someone that worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night, but they don't engage in the seeking of knowledge. They don't engage in the teaching of knowledge. Then you have someone that fulfills their minimal requirements and does a little bit more inshallah, but they have dedicated their lives to teaching. I want you to think about this. How many worshippers do you know from the pious predecessors? How many worshippers can you name? And then think about how many ulama, how many teachers and scholars can you name from the pious predecessors? In fact, the vast majority of them will be all scholars. They all had their personal ibadat and their stories without a shadow of a doubt. You need to have that. But you will remember the scholars because they have the greatest impact. They were more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed their legacy to reach us. Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Al-Tirmidhi, Al-Nasai, Ibn Umajah, Ishaq Abdul Rahawai, Sufyan Al-Thawri, Sufyan Ibn Uyayna, Abdullah Ibn Mubarak. All of these people were scholars. Right? So the point I want to get at is if you want to survive this dunya, you have to have some sort of active engagement in seeking knowledge. 
with a teacher, preferably in person. If unable to in person, then online. If unable to, then study the books of the scholars. If unable to, then at least be consistent in listening to those random lectures on a weekly basis. Do not make your Iman like that 10 second Iman. You watch a, a clip on TikTok and you know, I've I got my dose for the week. You're not gonna sustain faith that way. You'll feel good for a little bit. You might learn uh, uh, you know, some interesting fact in that point, but that is not knowledge. Knowledge is that which is done consistently at the feet of the scholars. If you can't do it at the feet of the scholars, then do it online with them. If you can't do it online with them, at least read their books. That is how knowledge is sought. And that is what we should be doing. So these are the principles that I wanted to share with you. To summarize, number one, understanding that your days will fluctuate, so act accordingly. Number two, is that success in the hereafter is to be entered into Jannah. Success in this life is to be content with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Number three, be very, very careful as to who you surround yourself with and who you are influenced by, and let them be people of deen. Choose your spouse as a person of deen, choose your friends as people of deen, choose the people that you follow on social media as people of deen. And number four, the last one that I shared, is that you will only survive by seeking knowledge. The only way to protect your iman is by seeking knowledge. And it is not contingent that you become a full-time student of knowledge is not contingent that you become a scholar or an imam, but just have consistent learning. Make that incorporated in your life. And that is how you will survive. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all evil and harm in this life and make us of those that are entered into Jannah al-Firdaus without hisab in the afterlife. Allahumma ameen. Wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik ashadu la ilaha ila ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk and inshallah I will take three questions and then we break inshallah so if anyone has a question please raise your hand and ask or forever hold your peace or let me go in peace inshallah Bismillah. Jazakumullah khairan, folks. Oh, you have a question? Allah Akbar. Go ahead. So, like, like the dunya is moving away from the knowledge. Like, because uh, of AI and, and media. The more knowledge you get in, right, it keeps like you are moving away in a way, right? So, how do you balance it? So, are you talking about the life of this world in general or social media specifically? Life in general. So, I mean, the general rule is, you know, Yahya ibn Kathir, he says, لا ينال العلم براحة الجسد That knowledge cannot be attained by, by living a life of, of comfort. And you can replace the life of the, the word knowledge over here with righteousness. That it becomes very hard to live a righteous life when you're living a comfortable life. So the more you have of the dunya, the more harder it becomes to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what that means is, and we didn't get a, a time to expand on this, but you have to have this framework with the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. And that framework is that you want to be more attached to the one that gave you the things, rather than the things themselves. Right? I want you to think about what happens when you get a, a car for the first time. It can be a brand new car or it could be your first car that's used. But when you get that car for the first time, you're so careful. You're gonna park it at the end of the parking lot because you don't want anyone to dig your car. Right, you're gonna keep it clean, you're gonna wash it and make sure that there's no dents on it, no scratches on it. Until finally, inevitably, a scratch is going to come, a ding is going to happen. And then you're like, who cares about the car now? Let it be, let it happen. But that is the reality of what this dunya does to you. You get so you know, consumed in your mind that I have to protect the things of this dunya. But who's going to protect your afterlife? So eventually, the realization you need to come to, there's two things, the giver and the gift. Attach your heart to the giver and not to the gift. The gifts will come and go. The giver is going to be there forever. Attach yourself to the giver 
And no matter what happens in your life, you will be content. Attach yourself to the gift. As soon as it comes, you are happy. As soon as it goes, you are sad. Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, when he was asked about zuhud, he said, true zuhud is that if you were to get uh, the equivalent of a million uh, dollars, it wouldn't make you happy. And if you were to lose a million dollars, it wouldn't make you sad. That is what true zuhud is. Because your heart is not attached to those material possessions, it is attached to the one that gave you those things. So this applies to everything in life. You overindulge in the life of this world, and iman becomes difficult. Good deeds become difficult. But attach your heart not to the things, but to one that gave them to you, and you will be able to enjoy the things that Allah gives you, but even if they are taken away, you still have your iman, and that is the most valuable uh, asset, treasure, and gift. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Go ahead. Uh, what is the best way that, to be close to the Quran, or make the Quran is the main, main model to, for Shabbat? I am not the right person to answer this question. Uh, I feel, so brother's question is with regards to, you know, how do you affiliate, how do you establish a good relationship with the Quran? And I give that disclaimer that subhanAllah, my own relationship with the Quran uh, is not where it should be. So I share this information not because I've reached a level of excellence in it. I reach, I share this with you because this is what I uh, aspire to be. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, uh, he alludes to the fact that the believer should be reciting five Jews of the Quran every day. That's what you should be striving for, to retain the Qur'an. Imam al-Qurdubi rahimahullah, he says, if you do a khatam of the Qur'an every uh, 40 days, then this is the, the khatam of the lazy people. If you do one khatam every 40 days, this is the khatam of the lazy people. What about those that will do one khatam in a lifetime? You know, I often wonder, especially in the Indian Pakistani culture, when the child at like 70 years old does a khatam of the Qur'an, there's a massive celebration, huge party. And I wonder, is that because they know that this child may never finish the Qur'an again? Let us celebrate it while he's at it. Because this may never happen again, so let us celebrate. Inshallah, I hope that's not the case, but I often wonder where that came from. So the point being, think about everything else that is important in your life, right? You know you have to eat, you know you have to sleep, and these are things that you can't compromise. But you should feel a level of pain when you don't have your daily recitation of the Qur'an. That is what it should look like. So try to affiliate your Qur'an with something that you do all the time. So perhaps, you know, after one of the salahs, just sit down and read as much Qur'an as you can for 20 minutes. Or read a little bit of the Qur'an after every salah. Or before you go to bed, read some Qur'an. But try to find something that you can anchor your Qur'an to. That because you can't miss that thing, it also means that you'll never miss your recitation of the Qur'an. Number two, sign up for a Qur'an program. Even if you're half of the Qur'an and you know the Qira'at, find a Qur'an teacher. And that is someone that will keep you in check. And you'll have peers and friends that will check up on you as well. For one of the beautiful things about Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma is that they competed for the deen. So compete for the deen with your friend in the recitation of the Qur'an. Hey, did you read your juice of the Qur'an today? Or did you read your pages of the Qur'an today? This friend that will compete with you. And that's one of the best things to do. So I think those two steps of number one, anchoring the Qur'an to something that you have to do, and number two, signing up for a Qur'an program and having people that you compete with, those are the, the best things that you can do. Along with studying the virtues uh, of memorizing the Qur'an and learning the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I want to give a last opportunity to the sisters. Any questions? Okay, right, folks, let's conclude over here, inshallah. Because I believe uh, they're going to be having Salat al Isha soon, inshallah. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdika, shadow la ilaha illa anta, astaghfirullah, wa tubi ilaik, jazakum al khairan, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.